In the last month since the last, we had one session, and I should say that each of these sessions are self-contained. So I see a lot of folks in the room who were here last time, and I'm so glad to see you again. And then there's some new faces as well. Um, and so they are self-contained, and occasionally I will make some references for those of you who were here last time. But it has gotten me thinking a little bit about the nature of doing um, sort of teaching and learning workshops. And John and I have had some good discussions about this. Um, and there's this complicated thing that we know about learning, which is that real deep learning, conceptual change takes time. And I know I've done a lot of professional development in K through 12 schools, and I hear the same thing from teachers all the time. I wanna to go to PD where I could take an activity with me the next day, right? And do it the next day in the classroom. And I'd always bristle against that a little bit. And I've been thinking about why, and John and I have had some good conversations, and it made me think, huh, you know, if there's an activity that you could learn today and do tomorrow, it probably is not significantly different than your current practice, if it makes perfect sense for you for how to do it. Um, and yet, at the same time, this isn't a lecture series, it's a workshop series, right? And we don't all have the space and the, like the intellectual space and time to just sit and let ideas stew. We need to be able to integrate them. I told John, I was thinking, I was an English teacher, so I like to think in, I think in metaphors a lot. And I was thinking about my garden, probably because the ground is so frigidly cold. I'm just trying to imagine a moment when things will be green. And I was thinking, you know, come August, if I've had some things die off, I know that I can plant arugula and in three weeks time, I will have an arugula salad. Arugula is fast, right? It doesn't necessarily go super deep in the roots, but it is, it is fruitful, right? Asparagus, on the other hand, which I love, you plant one year and you cannot start harvesting for two or three years. You have to watch it grow, know that the roots aren't ready yet. You can't cut it, right? You gotta let those roots grow further. This year we get to start eating asparagus, more than one stock every couple of weeks. Um, so, in, in designing this workshop, I was thinking, okay, I want a little asparagus. We're gonna make sure that when you walk away, not asparagus, sorry, a little arugula, we're gonna make sure that you walk away, and hopefully there are some things that you feel like you can integrate. But then there's also gonna be a little bit of asparagus, where maybe there are some ideas that it won't be clear right away, that I couldn't even necessarily workshop with you and think about how, what is this going to look like for what I do differently in class next week, or even next semester when I design my syllabus. Mm -hmm. But I do hope that some of the ideas and some of the theories and research on teaching and learning maybe sit with you as you continue to reflect on your teaching and learning over the course of your careers, right? As, as I do, and I think we all do. So for today's session, we're, taking, we're tackling three topics. One is reconsidering prior knowledge. What do we think about when we think about prior knowledge? Promoting transfer, how do we promote transfer? And developing metacognition in our students. And for each topic, I'm going to take th uh, several approaches. For almost each of them, I'll conduct a short sort of lesson demo. Um, then I'll provide some theoretical and empirical background for that topic. I will showcase some of the pedagogical approaches I use in my classroom related to the topics. And then there'll be some time for you to reflect on your practice and, and develop some activities. So we're going to begin by reconsidering prior knowledge. And I'd like to start with a question for you all, um, what, which sort of relates to this big question. What do we think of when we consider our students' prior knowledge? So think quite, get specific. Think about a course you teach or a workshop you design, right? What kind of prior knowledge do we assume students have when coming into that course? Okay, so think about something specific. Um, and actually, it would just help me. I'm looking at Jessica and knowing that, do you teach semester-long courses or you do, you do a lot of workshops, I know? We do a lot of workshops, but we also have one credit and two credit semester-long. Okay, so those might be, but you can think in either direction. Um, for the rest of the audience, I know some of you and not all, how many of you, do most folks teach like a semester-long course? Generally, yeah. Anyone who doesn't, it's more sort of the workshop model or the one or two credits? Okay. Or my anomaly, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, can anyone give me some examples? Think about a course you teach pretty regularly. And what are the sort of kinds of knowledge, you'll be specific, right, to your department, to your discipline, what are the kinds of knowledge you sort of expect your students have when coming in that, that you expect you can build from, or you can assume that they have? 
Yeah. I teach a advanced forensic chemistry class, and I, I know that they've all had general chemistry, organic chemistry. So, yeah. Some physics, some biology, some math. So I, I know that they're, they've had a lot of classes already at WPU. And what are the ways in which, so this is an advanced forensic chemistry course. Can you hear him? Awesome, okay. Um, just trying to figure out if I had to repeat. Um, and so, and what are the kinds of ways in which you assume, you know you can build from those math chemistry courses? That yeah, like if we talk about acid-base phenomena, I, I know they've all, they've all got that. This is this concept that most students can just get in a semester of chemistry, it's fine. There are other concepts like how instruments work, how scientific instruments work, and I, maybe a quarter of the class have had that, that course. The rest have not. So that's tricky that's too. Okay. Great example. Others, other folks who have, hey there, um, who can think of a specific course that you, uh, that you teach where you are assuming that your students have certain kinds of prior knowledge. But yeah. Well, my experience in building on prior knowledge is that exposure isn't knowledge. So I teach a 400 level plant systematics where there are prerequisites. And so something like, oh, mitosis and meiosis, I know for sure that they have had that and supposedly understand and know it, but I can just tell when I start to try to talk about things like polyploidy or you know reproductive biology, and, and they're still there, and I've learned now that I have to at least do a refresher, if not teach the whole thing over again, because just because I know that they were exposed and even tested on it, um, it, it doesn't mean that they're secure enough in their knowledge to be able to build on it. Okay. So this is interesting. And in some ways you helped me get to my next question, right? Or next set of questions. How do we build from it? But you've sort of gotten to this next question. How do we know if they have it? Right? So you're saying this is pH, right? We know that, or like, you know, acid base. So how do we figure that out? How do we figure out, you say like, I can tell when I start talking. Is it just that glazed look? What are the ways in which we try to figure out what our students' prior knowledge is? If what we think they have, we can assume they have and we, could, we can build from it. Yeah. Um, well, I teach epidemiology and so what I do with um, some of my courses, I actually give a pretest the first day of the semester and, um, you know, I tell them it's not graded. It, I'm not going to think any less of you. Right. I just kind of, you know, to see where they're at. So then I kind of know, all right, I have to go over this a lot more or this, they have no idea. And that's kind of how I go from there. Um, and so there's some design in the moment. Right, we like to plot out our classes over the course of the semester, thinking we know week to week what we can do. We cannot always do that, right? Sometimes we'll have to do some shifting based on what our students uh, let us know with something like a, a pretest. Yeah. yeah a, a couple of things. I, I do the pretest as well, although I um, often give them extra credit for the better they, they do because they'll crawl over broken glass naked for extra credit. Excellent. <laughs> but it, it also, really jog their memory. <laughs> you must have been exposed to this. But, but it also helps to, um, to speak with your colleagues that have taught the prior okay. courses. Because yeah. you know, then, then you can give the message, hey, look, I know you may be rusty. Uh, looking at the results, I know that you're rusty in here and here. And however, these are, I'm telling you, these are areas where you need to spend a little time outside of class getting yourself back caught up because we can't spend the amount of time that you may like us to spend on these review topics. It really is kind of up to you to get yourself back up to snow. So it makes me, so there are two things you say there that I think are really interesting. One, you're talking about epi epidemiology. I'm thinking about how a team of doctors work, right? It's rare that we have a patient and it's just one doctor, you know, especially if it's a really big problem, right? Dealing with what's going on. Usually you've got a team of folks who can consult with one another. You should also be considering this. You need to also take this perspective. And as teachers and instructors, we could probably do the same thing, right? We're not the first people who've had these students, so we can consult with people who've taught this class before. What are the kinds of things that really stick, you know, that you think, you think, you know, you can assume your students have, and what, what are areas that you typically think they must have, and yet they don't? Um, or the people who've taught them, if you're teaching a 300 level class, who's taught the, most of those students in a 200 level class, if it's systematic like that, right? My husband's a history professor, and there are no prerequisites in history. 
So he right now is teaching a 400 level class on fascism and he has students who are not familiar with who the major players are in World War II. So that makes teaching that class a little bit more challenging for him. He has to think about it. This is really helpful. All right, so we've thought a little bit about how do we know if students have it, right? We could talk to our colleagues. We can um, do these pretests. Um, we may need to do some sort of in the moment improvisational sort of design, redesign, right? Oh, I wasn't, I really assumed you all knew this. I'm gonna have to add in another lecture, another activity to make sure we have this idea, these ideas covered. Um, and if we don't always ask these questions, we probably should be. What are the assumptions I'm making? What is the knowledge I'm assuming students are building from? And we're gonna talk a lot about this notion of building from knowledge. But this section, uh, this topic, was not called prior knowledge, it was called reconsidering prior knowledge. And I am going to ask you to shift a little bit in how you're thinking about prior knowledge. Because if we think about all of the kinds of prior knowledge that you've mentioned, they're all content-based. Now that makes a lot of sense. We're conditioned to think about prior knowledge related to content because we're content experts, right? So when we're coming to understand some complex chemical idea, right, we know the foundation for us has to do with maybe pH, right, or, or acid base. Um, but that may or may not be the most effective pathway for our student to get to that new knowledge, okay? And I'm gonna give, going to give you an example. And this is, I try to do Taco Town, to show Taco Town pretty much in any class I can get away with it, right? So it's one of my favorites. Did not discover until I searched for this image that there's a bit of a cult following from this, um, this ad, and we'll talk about this a little bit. So this is an advertisement I'm going to show you um, called Taco Town. All right, so I want you to watch this ad and think about how you're making sense of it as it goes. Tell me a little bit about Taco Town. How are you making sense of this as you were watching it? And I know the audio wasn't great. Sorry, we could not get it any louder than that. But I hope it was loud enough for you to get a sense. Well, I mean, you, you identify quickly that it's, that it's, you know, satire or whatever. It's, it's fake. OK, so how do you identify that satire? I'm going to take some notes uh, while you're, is that OK? Can I move? Yes, all right. I'm going to take a few notes. So, how did you figure out that it was satire, that it was fake? Well, they're, they're, you know, the actors are familiar. Okay, so familiar actors, and how are they familiar exactly? Uh, television, you know, comedies, you know, whatever, Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live, okay, so there's a familiar outlet here, and that outlet is a satirical outlet, right? Okay, so we know that this is a common satirical outlet. Um, okay, excellent. So you might immediately recognize one of the actors, probably many of you did. You even might have saw, seen SNL in the corner. Oh, it's Saturday Night Live. I'm assuming that this is, this is not satire. I've shown this to students who don't have televisions and who are not familiar with any of the actors and not that familiar with Saturday Night Live, okay? And I will also tell you they don't, I have had, no, I've shown this for probably a decade now. I've had one student who did not realize it's satire, just thought it was ridiculous, but what are some other ways, let's say you did not know that this was, you did not know the actors, right? And you didn't know SNL, what that was referencing, or you didn't catch it. What are some other ways you might have figured out that it was satire? Whose laughter? You could hear laughter in the, uh, in the background. The audience. The audience was laughing. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, people's reactions. Um, in this case, it was the viewers. Okay, so it was certainly, I might call it hyperbolic, right? It's like a lot of exaggeration, hyperbole. And give me an example, maybe. Well, like by the third layer, you start to question whether or not that's, you know, it's just too much. <laughs> and what's too much about it? Uh, well, like the actors are responding, it's, you can see it's like, it's starting to get too big. It's a little bit too complicated. You don't really need all that. Like like, and then this. <laughs> okay, so right. So there's a couple of things that happen there, right? One, it's not realistic. They can't even get it in their mouths, right? So, like, so we have this like moment when it's no longer realistic. 
And then can you say a little bit more about the narrator who has this interesting role? It's just the classic guy going, and one more, and one more, and he just keeps going. So he keeps going. exaggerates. And okay, so there's a lot of repetition, a lot of hyperbole and exaggeration. Um, and then I also, I always find interesting with the narrator, he breaks the typical rule. So they start talking to him in a way that you don't often hear, like in a commercial, right? Can we eat it now? And they're sort of looking up. And then he'll sometimes interrupt them in a way that sort of, again, breaks some conventions and norms that we're used to. Um, okay, I'll stop here. When I do this with students, we could, we could keep going. Like this, we could have three boards full, right? Um, there are a lot of ways in which we know that this is satire. Do you all remember how you learned satire in school? Anyone remember what was like a typical way, sort of introduction? How many people read A Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift? All right, only two of you. Usually I would say a half to two thirds of my classes have read A Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift. Have, most, has, have other people read it? It just wasn't sort of maybe their gateway to satire. Not sure. All right. So quite often, how many, for how many of you is this familiar? with a literary, um, some sort of literary idea. Um, your teacher might begin or your professor might begin with a definition that they provide you, right? Does that feel familiar? So today we're going to learn about satire. What is satire? Like everyone to take out their notebooks, you don't have to do this, <laughs> and write down this definition. A literary work holding up human vices and follies to ridicule or scorn, okay. We can think about the 19-year-olds, but also the 14-year-olds were introduced to satire in this way, right? Now, this definition probably makes a lot of sense to most of us, right? How many of our 14-year-olds or 19-year-olds are able to make real meaning of this thing? Not so much, right? So, okay, satire is being introduced as something pretty foreign, right? I looked up a couple of sort of spark note sites to see, like, how is it typically introduced? And this is quite similar with, um, um, with textbooks as well. So a modest proposal is one of the most commonly anthologized examples of satire that students read. And most often it's introduced with something like this. By the time A Modest Proposal was published in 1729, Ireland had been under English rule for 500 years. You get the, you know, you get the idea. Sometimes there'll be some background on Jonathan Swift himself, who he was. Now, does this set up students for really getting satire? No. They're not, first of all, they're not going to read it. Does any of them help build from the prior knowledge that's actually relevant, that for them, Right? Now, it's not that this isn't relevant. If I'm a scholar of Irish literature, this is all quite relevant. It's how I make meaning, in part, of a modest proposal. But it's not necessarily the best path for my students' meaning making. So if you're not familiar with a modest proposal, it is a sort of tri a, a treatise written by um, Jonathan Swift in jest, where he says, okay, listen, in Ireland right now, 1700s, we have overpopulation and we have famine. What's a great fix for this? Start eating babies, right? Right, it's satirical. And there is, it is incisive, it is very clear in its political commentary. But most of our students who are reading this don't have that way in. Right? They certainly don't have the backgrounds. Even if we gave it to them in the textbook, they probably did not read it. Even if we lectured them to, about it, it sort of went past them. And it takes a long time for them to figure out that it's satirical, right? And often it's the introduction to satire. Think about if we might decide that a modest proposal is such a fine literary work and such a great example of satire that it is absolutely worth teaching. And I love it, I think it's fantastic. It's certainly not what I begin with. And if I wanted to ultimately get here, if this was my target for my students, doesn't it might make sense that I might think about prior knowledge that's familiar and relevant to my students 
as being what I build from. Rather than introducing these kinds of prior knowledge, right? Here's a definition that's not going to make a whole lot of sense to you. Here's some historical background that you're not really going to make a lot of meaning of, right? That's not really very meaningful to you and is quite dry. Um, and now make some sense of this. Oh, yeah, kids just don't get satire today. Instead, if I begin with Taco Town, which all of my students get, our students are seeped in satire, right? It's such a part of popular culture. Why wouldn't we begin with that? Help them understand what they already know about satire and have that be the foundational prior knowledge. They're probably going to get sort of curious. Why is Jonathan Swift proposing that we eat babies? What's going on in Ireland in the 1700s? What was this thing anyway? Was it an op-ed, right? They'd probably ask the kinds of questions and get curious about it because they had enough way of framing what it was to start digging in. And then they might figure out or find out or come to know all the other stuff we'd want them to know about it as well, right? What this approach allows us to do is one, set up our students as feeling efficacious from the start. Rather than giving them a definition that doesn't make sense to them, providing them saying, this is the prior knowledge you need in order to get to understand this, but you don't have any of it now, right? They're not starting out from a place of really feeling that they can do it, a place of efficacy. But if we show them how their existing knowledge can help them understand these complex things, right? That they have meaningful and relevant schemata that may not be the same sort of foundations of our schema, right, for a modest proposal or satire, but are meaningful to them, we help starting them feel self-efficacious, as I said, agentive, right? They're the ones who can think about how can I build from this, right? Okay, I do understand Saturday Night Live skits. I get that. I can be involved, right? I can have a more agentive role in learning, in meeting making, because I'm building from things that I already know. In the last session, we had some back and forth about the fact that students don't often take a very active role in classrooms. That is very true. I think we teach them to be passive. Right? So if we start out saying, this is all the stuff you need to know, you don't know it already, okay, now let's engage in a dialogue, they're probably less likely to do that. But if we're starting out in a place where they're pretty excited to talk about stuff, right? Yeah, I want to talk about Taco Town. And we're showing them that they have relevant prior knowledge, they may start feeling more agentive when it comes to their learning, and then they might start engaging in conversations and discussions and be more active in their learning process. But finally, perhaps, I'd say the most important argument for building from students' existing prior knowledge is it makes our job a lot easier, right? We don't know all the pathways towards meaning making for our students, but certainly starting from a place that's a place of strength for our students helps in a, in a in deep, deeply developed knowledge is makes our jobs much easier, makes the learning we're asking them to do um, more effective. We talked in the last session a lot about schema theory. So this is review for some of you and for some of you new. The idea of schema theory is simply this. We can think about knowledge as being, knowledge is well organized. We don't have a bunch of discrete different ideas floating around, but generally through learning, right, we organize our knowledge and we can think of it as schematics, right? Where we might have different connections of different parts of knowledge, right? Some knowledge is foundational for other kinds of knowledge. Some is more conceptual and some is, is, um, is, is, perhaps, um, is perhaps more concrete. If we ultimately want to get here with our students, and we assume this is the, most, the pathway that makes most sense because it's how we make sense of this target. Without really inquiring to the range of ways, the range of kinds of relevant prior knowledge our students have, 
we may not be taking the easiest path towards our students ultimately getting to our goal, our academic goal. So I want to take you back to um, that idea of how do you know what your students know, right? How do you know what your students' prior knowledge is? Another piece of that question may be, how do you find out what potentially relevant prior knowledge your students have? And in which case, a diagnostic test, may, that might not be the best way. That still gives us really important information. We do want to know how much do they know that, we're, you know that we assume that they know, but this becomes a different kind of diagnostic tool. What are the range of kinds of knowledge that our students might have that may in fact be relevant that I might not even know to ask about? Um, and that inquiry on our part looks different and it's probably a little bit harder. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples, or I'll give you one example from one of my classes. So I teach, uh, I regularly teach an introductory methodology class for researchers, for doctoral students. It's a qualitative methods class. Um, and if you read a lot of qualitative methodology, like anything else, it is full of jargon, or it feels like jargon to an outsider, right? It gets very, um, it's, it gets esoteric, like all of our work does. It can be very technical. Um, there's a lot of terminology that's not familiar. And yet many of the things that we're asking students or asking researchers to do or that researchers do in qualitative methods in many ways are very familiar, right? Observation, interviewing, talking, right? Reading, document analysis. Similarly, a lot of times students, when I ask them, well, why are you studying what you're studying? They'll say, oh, I had a great professor who introduced me to this idea, right? And I was really good at, at that kind of work, so I pursued that further, right? And it tends to stay at that academic level. When in fact, I think all, almost all of us could figure out the ways in which we're drawn to our fields because of something sort of deeply personal, probably, right? Sometimes it's really important that we come back to that on occasion because um, we can get lost in all the other things. So at the very beginning of class, of this course, I asked students to do a reflection online um, where I asked them to reflect on the roots of their research interests. From where do they stem? If you look back over your life, so I have to explicitly prompt this, right? If you look back over your whole life, right? Do you see where the seeds may have been planted for your current curiosities? What were those seeds? How do they grow into an element of who you are today? Some of these seeds may be topic specific. For example, and here again, I'm cueing them outside of the academic realm with an example from my life. I was an avid reader as a child, quite separate from any assigned readings from school. So perhaps it was unsurprising that my first line of research examined teachers reading lives outside the classroom. Some of these seeds may be methodological, methodological in nature. Did your family love to tell stories around the dinner table? Might that relate to your interest in narrative research? Are you the type of person who likes to sit quietly on the margins of a room and observe others rather than taking part? Might that relate to your inclination towards non-participant ethnographic approaches, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So you see how I'm really cueing them to think outside the sort of academic norms. Now, do my students walk away from this course with a very detailed and understanding of a range of approaches to interview, to, to um, ethnographic field notes and observation, to document analysis, absolutely. In the end, their knowledge is academic, right? But I try to sort of stimulate for them, activate for them some of those relevant elements of their prior knowledge, the schema they might, the schemata they might not have thought to bring to bear, right? But I'm doing some explicit work to have them bring those things to bear. And here's one example from a student that I think is quite beautiful, and I get a lot of these. And I will also say I have a lot of students who will say things like, I hadn't thought about this before, or I hadn't realized, but there is a seed for my current interest. For this one, I can still remember when I was a child, my mom would read me classic Chinese poetry and have me recite the poems. Sometimes when I went on an excursion with my dad, he would ask me to describe what I saw and how I felt about them. I would even write a, in a journal on what I saw and felt after the excursion occasionally. I feel grateful that although my parents are not particularly academically educated, they offered me as much as they could in my early childhood education. 
that I believe that I believe helped me develop an interest in playing with language at an early age. It seems that my early interest in language does not have an effect, direct impact on the specific topics I'm researching today. For what I'm doing today requires a bit of formal studies in language. However, the interest does help me navigate my academic choices and discover things that I'm passionate about. And then he goes on to explain in more detail the very academic linguistic interests that he has about the Chinese language. Um, so here's one example, okay? I'd like you now to think about your courses. And again, this is a different kind of inquiry into your student's knowledge than we typically think about with a diagnostic tool. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't still do those baseline um, kinds of tests. Those can give us a lot of important information. But think about one of your courses that you teach. Ultimately, I'd like you to be able to answer these questions. What are the range of no kinds of knowledge that students may bring to the classroom that we don't know to build from, but that could be useful? And what knowledge may serve as building blocks for your students' understanding of new ideas in your course? But before we can answer those, we have to inquire into our students knowing, right? What they know, how they know about the world around them. So think about designing an inquiry activity, like the discussion board prompt, right, that I shared with you, that may help you uncover meaningful student knowledge that is relevant to significant ways of thinking or knowing in your course. So that's what I'd like us to take a little time to do now, is designing this activity that could ultimately help us answer those other questions. Does that make sense, what I'm asking, or do you have questions? All right, so pick one course. The more specific you can be, the better. And it's probably one topic from that course, right? And what is an activity? Think about designing an activity that can help you sort of uncover some knowledge that you may not, you don't yet know that your students have, right? But that may be relevant. I could not have told you that this student took these walks with his parents who asked them to describe the world around him and that that would help him later on think about linguistics, right? But the prompt gave him space to be able to share that with me, all right? So let's take about five minutes and it's just gonna be the ske a sketch of something, some initial ideas, and then we'll share some of those out, okay? Um, does anyone wanna share out? So I asked you to, um, I asked you to think about some ways of um, inquiring into your students' lives, de designing an activity that helps them, um, helps them sort of come to understand for themselves and share with you some types of knowledge they have that is relevant for your target, right? What we want them to know, but may not be something that we knew they already had, right? We really had to allow them space to uncover it. Um, and John made a really important point to me when we were talking about this. He said, you know, in this way too, this is an activity that promotes metacognition as well, right? Unlike a diagnostic test, sometimes a diagnostic test can be a really good metacognitive tool for our students. What do you already know? What are you confident with? But sometimes it's just for us this kind of activity, right, and you saw from my student's answer, allows the student to also reflect on what are my resources for knowledge that I can build from. So it has both of those kinds of affordances. What are some of the ideas that you all came up with? And be specific with us. Tell us the course and describe the activity. Uh, how scientific instruments work mm -hmm. and the sources of error in those instruments and how we correct for them. Right. right. And, and what what's okay and what's not okay. Mm -hmm. There's random variants and there's not random variants and how you figure them out, how you correct them. So I thought one way to, to probe about the prior knowledge would be to ask them if they can think of situations in their lives where they ever put something into like a black box. It doesn't have to be not non material black box, but like there's yes. something that they can they know what it is and they put it in. Something different comes out. And and how do they how can they understand the relationship between what comes out and what went in? Like, like it could be ingredients in a cake, yes. right? I mean, you put, you mix them all together, put them in, and what comes out is totally different. And, and who's to say that the cake should be three inches tall or, or two, two inches tall or three inches tall? I mean, all you know is if you do the same thing over and over again, it probably come out the same each time. 
and that yes, if you, you do the same with scientific instruments. always so. made this cake at home right mm -hmm. on your mother's birthday and now you're in a dorm and you tried making this cake with the dormitory kitchen you know oven and surprise it doesn't come out the same way you you would have to first inquire into what happens in that black box and then recalibrate and so they're sort of familiar this is silly i'm thinking of autocorrect you learn to recalibrate for autocorrect right you put something in it's not what comes out the other side and you have to say okay what was the phone thinking to change that for me, right? um sometimes it you know it takes a little bit of work to recalibrate that. yeah that's that's fantastic i love it yeah this is very very close to glenn's is um in terms of dealing with significant figures and measurements that lead to other areas um fitbits oh yes because you know i'm walking right now according yes. to my fitbit <laughs> and so using this you know and asking students to actually think about all what's what's the size of each error that leads into the walking 1.7 miles at, at, a, at a point. And might scientists ever take advantage of error when it works in their favor? Oh, look how much I walk today in office hours because I talk with my hands. <laughs> Fantastic. Maybe one more. Yeah. So I'm teaching genetics on the level. So I was expecting some more science related students in law, but then it turned out to be one biology, one immunology, and about 27 students are all from psychology, sociology, oh, business, engineering uh, department, even I never knew this uh, major exists. Actually, she's working on how to make a uh, puppet. Yes. Yeah. Right. We have an amazing puppetry program. program. It's right. right. Yeah. yeah. And then okay. I was uh, supposed to talk about DNA replication. Okay. <laughs> so then I actually brought three donuts. There's one donut. And then when you replicate oh, this donut, they become two. So can you explain what could happen here? So what is the ingredient to make one donut to two? So then they say, well, I need that one more donut. Okay, so what is the ingredient to make a one more <laughs> donut? So then everybody would say flour, sugars. All right, so the, that is replication, the definition of replication, duplication from one and two. But then now, how do you start? So before I ask them, I ask uh, back, so you have a donut and then all of a sudden it became one donut to become two donuts? There has to be a start point. So what do you think is the starting point? Then very quiet. <laughs> so then the start, the terminology with the start, meaning they have to get defined the position because that is the start. So I refer back to their knowledge that the embedded the brain already know. So my approach is to always look for the daily life, try to connect what you are going to learn and how you make 100 donuts from few ingredients. Instead of we who are teaching 100 different donuts, just to throw at them, hoping that we could, we, desire them to digest it, which nobody does that. So that is the, my approach. And I think what's important about what you said, and it's important for us to realize too, sometimes we can assume certain knowledge, right? Kids get donuts and baking. So you know that that's a generative example for all of your students and it doesn't matter what major they are, what their background knowledge is. Similarly for Taco Town, I, you know, more than 99 times out of 100, my students are able to make meaning of that and recognize it as satire. But there are other things like the prompt about my student's background or asking them for their black box examples, right? Or asking them, you know, asking them these questions that we don't know what we're going to get back, right? And so those are two different ways of building from prior knowledge. Sometimes if we go back to this image of a schema, you know, sometimes we say, I make meeting 
towards replication in this way. But I do know that my students get this idea of baking. So I'm going to use that as my pathway in. And other times we're saying, I don't know what the meaningful prior knowledge that my students have is. I don't know what's relevant. And so there's, this is gonna be more about inquiring, right? Rather than assuming. Um, and we can do both and they both seem relevant. These are fantastic, thank you. All right, now that we've talked about prior knowledge, let's talk about transfer, right? So it doesn't help if our students have a lot of relevant information, if they don't know how to transfer it to create, you know, to come to new understandings, right? Um, so this man on the front asked me, what's the difference between prior knowledge and knowledge, right? If you have knowledge, it's prior. That makes a lot of sense, except that we have knowledge that we want our students to develop, right? Even better, maybe we develop new knowledge as a result of engaging with our students. So yeah, knowledge, the prior knowledge is what they already know. We want to help them develop new knowledge that then becomes prior knowledge, which actually leads me to something I'll explain in a moment. <laughs> um, so I mentioned this in the last workshop. I'm a big fan of these books by National Academies Press. A lot of my quotations are from the older edition, just because I'm more familiar with it, of how people learn. But How People Learn 2 was published this winter. Um, these are both fully free from National Academies Press. You can download them. You could read them online. You could download them as PDFs. They're not expensive to buy. Um, I hand these out of my office like hotcakes. I love them. <laughs> um, and uh, what How People Learn does is it's written by committee and it really makes very accessible a lot of the big ideas around learning and learning theory. And it builds from all of the current research. That's why it's great that a new one came out <laughs> because the other one was about 20 years old. Um, it builds from current research. And so it lets you do two things. One, helps make really accessible some complex ideas about learning. But also, if you are curious about delving deeper, there's a whole slate of empirical articles that you can follow up with. Um, and so um, there's a nice, you know, easy definition of transfer and how people learn. The ability to extend what has been learned in one context to new contexts. Pretty simple, right? Educators hope that students will transfer learning from one problem to another within a course, from one year in school to another, between school and home, from school to workplace, right? As we've been saying, from course to course, certainly. Okay, and I think it's important getting back to this notion that we discussed um, just a moment ago, that it's important to think about transfer in, two, in sort of two directions, right? It's actually all going maybe in the same direction. But we can think of this yellow arrow, right, as the direction of, you know, what they already know, what our students already know, and how we're going to build from that to this rectangle of our course, right? So I want to build from what you already know and help you transfer that relevant knowledge that you have to the learning environment we have right now together in this course. But that's only one element of transfer that's really important, right? The second element of transfer is that we want to make sure that they take what they've learned in our course and they're able to apply it in new contexts where it's relevant. And so that might be especially important. We're talking about conferring with colleagues. What if we're teaching the 200 level class and next semester we're talking to the 300 level instructor who says, gosh, none of them got whatever that was, right, out of that class that you taught. And you'd say, no, I taught it, right? So did they not absorb it, as we said? They were exposed, but they didn't learn it. They don't know to transfer it. Are they not being, is that transfer not being promoted? Um, and so we need to be thinking about transfer in both of those directions. So um, Gick and Holyoke, I don't know if that's how you say his name. That's always how I say the name. Um, did this fantastic study, okay? And this is way back when, but this has been, um, variations of this have been done over time. Um, we get the same kinds of results and it will be just as you said, in fact, you've seen the same thing happen in your classroom. So I wanna talk about this notion of flexible transfer and how it doesn't really happen on its own. So here's a study that was done. College students were presenting with the following passage about a general and a fortress. A general wishes to capture a fortress located in the center of a country. There are many roads radiating, out, radiating outward from the fortress. All have been mined so that while small groups of men can pass over the road safely, a large force will detonate the mines. A full-scale attack, direct attack is therefore impossible. 
The general solution is to divide his army into small groups, send each group to the head of a different road, have the groups converge simultaneously onto the fortress, right? Great war strategy that makes a lot of sense, right? We're breaking up the big troop into smaller troops, right? And so that no one, uh, no group is going to detonate these mines. And yet we'll have the full force of the whole army on the fortress at the same time. Terrific. Then students were given this passage. You were a doctor and they, they're not just, they were given the passage and asked to memorize it, like really understand it, okay? Then they're given this passage. You are a doctor faced with a patient who has a malignant tumor in his stomach. It is impossible to operate on the patient, but unless the tumor is destroyed, the patient will die. There is a ray that may be used to destroy the tumor. If the rays reach the tumor all at once and with sufficiently high intensity, the tumor will be destroyed, but the surrounding tissue may be damaged as well. At lower intensities, the rays are harmless to healthy tissue, but they will not affect the tumor either. What type of procedure might be used to destroy the tumor with the rays and at the same time avoid destroying the healthy tissue? Now, because I've set this up as a problem of transfer, you've probably all figured out what the solution is, right? Um, that if we broke up the rays so that they were less intensive but had them radiating from different points all on the tumor at the same time, just in the same way that the army was broken up on the different um, roads, we could successfully kill the tumor and not hurt the surrounding tissue. But few students were able to solve this problem when left to their own devices. But 90% were able to solve the tumor problem when they were explicitly told to use the information about the general in the fortress to help them. These students perceived the analogy between dividing the troops into small units and a number of small dose rays that each converge on the same point, the cancerous tissue. Okay, so they get it when prompted. When I teach Taco Town, I teach it in a lesson on transfer. I used to teach it, right, with my high school students when I teach satire, but now I use it with my teacher education students when I'm teaching about transfer. And I do Taco Town and then we take a break. And when I come back, I set up the reading of an article that's usually really serious, okay? So for example, this often hits around Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in September at the beginning of the school year, okay, which the Jewish high holidays. And I say, you know, I'm, I'm in class today, but it's around the time of the Jewish holidays. And I thought, thought I'd share a little bit of my culture with you. So I'd like you to read this article. And it's an article called something like um, Mel Brooks creates organization to save the word schmuck. Through his, orga through his organization, Schmucks for Schmucks, or something like this, okay? Schmucks for Schmuck. And it's an article from The Onion. I don't know how many of you are familiar with The Onion, but it's a satirical newspaper. But because I've set it up and I've primed it to be about a serious, you know, a serious acknowledgement of my Jewish heritage and culture, um, and I have not cued them to be thinking about Taco Town, which we just did 10 minutes before, and I have this on the board, right? Or we've just written this up together. This is a funny article, right? And you can see I have 115 students in front of me, and they're reading it quite seriously. And every once in a while, someone will say, oh, you know, mm -hmm. and someone might giggle, and then the person next to them, shh, she's Jewish. You know, they take it very seriously. <laughs> I probably wasn't fair that I added the cultural layer in, but, um, and so by the end, most of them, but not all of them get it. And I, I actually, I shouldn't say that. By the end, no one is laughing, right? Everyone looks at me seriously and I say, tell me about the article. And very tentatively, after they've told me about the Yiddish language and Mel Brooks, I think I've heard of him. And yeah, I think I've heard this word schmuck before. Um, one of them will say, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to take this seriously, right? I've totally set them up not to, right? In fact, I sort of impeded it, even though it seems so obvious this is not a serious article. Um, and once, even once they realize that they're not supposed to take it seriously, they don't label it as satire. It takes, again, a little bit of pushing for someone to say, Oh, right. This is like the other thing. This is satire also. And I'll say, okay, how do we know that it's satire? And then when they reread it with this sort of 
list like we made. How do we recognize satire, right? Oh, it's hyperbolic, it's not realistic, right? Et cetera, et cetera. It breaks down conventions and norms, then they start getting it. Um, so transfer is hard and it doesn't happen automatically until we cue it. So we can prime it to happen. That's lovely, right? So here are the things we need to know about transfer. One, the initial learning that we're trying, or the initial knowledge that we're trying to build from must be robust. If it's superficial, it's not going to work. So something like building from popular culture and satire, I'm really confident about that, right? Because that's something that my, our students are so steeped in. But there might be other things that we assume our students can transfer from, right? They, or they can transfer to a novel context. But if it hasn't been deeply understood, it does not, tra it does not transfer successfully. Um, and this maybe comes back to those diagnostic tests we were talking about before, that if we assume, yeah, yeah, they've got this because it's on, it's on the syllabus from last semester, but they haven't really deeply come to understand it, transfer is not going to happen. It's also important to remember that all learning involves transfer. And this goes back to the last session where we talked about the blank slate. It's never a blank slate. You're always building from something. So we are always transferring new knowledge, uh, transferring existing knowledge to new contexts when we're learning. And that's how we continue to grow and build and refine that knowledge. But it's never brand new. So transfer becomes this really essential conceptual cognitive tool, right, um, for us to think about when we're teaching. All learning involves transfer. Now, this is also important. Overly contextualized initial learning can limit transfer. Now, if you remember last semester, or last semester, <laughs> last session, those of you who are here, I introduced this really complex system that a researcher called Melo Silver, um, she, she um, shows how um, biologists and, ooh, food, <laughs> um, both biologists, um, biologists and fish tank um, enthusiasts understand the complex system of a fish tank's filtration system, right? And it is super complex. But what she found is that while they both had really robust, complex schema, that made sense of this ecology of a fish, fish tank filtration system, the biologists were able to take that same understanding of that complex filtration system and apply it to other contexts. So they might be able to apply it to a pond, right, or a natural water source. Because they've studied filtration and water ecology in many contexts. And they have these rules, these principles, these overriding concepts that they're able to apply. Whereas the fish tank enthusiasts could not. So if given a problem that, that, that's really parallel to a problem that they might engage with their fish tank, that has to do with, let's say, some natural body of water, they could not transfer. They're very deep and robust knowledge because it was so contextualized within the fish tank. So this is something we have to think about deeply. One, I'm concerned that a lot of our students don't think about how to transfer knowledge outside of this place, right? They may be able to do it even from class to class. They've sort of learned that game, you know? But even still, we know they often don't do that. You had this last semester, you should know how to apply it here. They don't do that transfer. But even more fundamentally, if we think about what our purpose is as instructors and an institution of higher education, we really want this, that, other, that last arrow to go outside of the next course, outside of the major, into the world, right? And what may be even harder is we don't know where that target is. I don't want all of my 19-year-olds to know exactly what career they're going to have, frankly. You know, some of them do, but I hope that some of them don't yet, that they come to figure that out but I still hope that I'm somehow able to give them knowledge that they can deploy in the future. 
So I can't have them practice it because I don't know what they're going to be doing in the future. So I want to make sure that what they have is, um, is adaptable and is flexible. And one of the ways in which we could do this is to do these abstractions. So if we go back to this list that we made before about how we knew that Taco Town was satirical, you'll notice nothing there relates specifically to Taco Town. So when someone said, well, I recognize the actors and I knew it was SNL, I didn't write that. I wrote common satirical outlet because that's often how we know. If I read something in The Onion, I'm expecting it's going to be satire because I know what The Onion is about or McSweeney's or whatever else is our favorite, you know, our favorite outlet source for, for good satire. Um, I made the, I ab abstracted these, extracted them so they could apply to any kind of satire so they become a tool for us, right? And we sort of hope we, um, that we can do the same things in our courses. And that's the way in which the biologist has these more conceptual principles that, that he or she is able to apply to multiple contexts, including novel situations. That's what we hope for, right? Is that our students can come to a new problem that they haven't seen before and figure out how to solve it. So if these things, if our knowledge is too contextualized, and I'd go so far as to say, think about things like tests, right? How many of our students just figure out how to deploy knowledge for the purpose of passing a test or doing well on a test? And in part, that's on us. If we're giving them assessments that are not authentic, and this sort of goes back to the disciplinary habits of mind that we talked about in the last workshop, they're learning how to take the test. They're maybe learning how to transfer the knowledge. I learned from your lecture into the test, but that may not be flexible and may not transfer out of that testing situation or writing that paper or whatever it is. So here's an example um, from one of my courses. There's a lot of text there, don't worry about it. We send you the PowerPoints and that's in part why I included all the text, but I'll just describe this to you. So I teach, I mentioned this, I teach a course on learning theories for teacher education students. Um, and so these are students who are going to become teachers. And one of the essential things we want students to be able, teachers to be able to do is to connect theories and, and empirically sound theories to specific contexts, right? So if I'm having a trouble with a student every day, I can't just problem solve this individual. You know, I, I want to come to understand, but then I also, I know things. I know things about childhood development. I know things about cognition. I know things about the content and learning the content that I can bring to bear to this specific situation. And that's a back and forth between theories and principles and concepts and specific, specific problems that I want my students to be able to do all the time. So how do I work towards that? I have three major assignments in this course on learning theories. In the first one, students go out and they find a lesson plan, right? Eventually, they'll be writing lesson plans when they're teachers, but it's too soon at this point in the course. They haven't really had that experience yet. So I ask them to go out and find a great lesson plan. And then I ask them to apply the theories from the course to that lesson plan. So every move that the teacher makes, they need to explain why the teacher is supposed to do that based on learning theory. So provide a rationale for each move in the lesson plan, okay? That's pretty static. That's not what the real teaching experience is like, right? So to recreate that a little further, to make that a little bit more complex for the next assignment, I have them do the same thing. I have them annotate a learning experience, but I ask them to find a video of a teaching and learning experience. So again, it's a little bit more complex. It's a little messier than a lesson plan. They find a video and they annotate the video, a transcript of the video, where again, they say, ah, oh, the teacher was asking the student these questions. I think they were inquiring to their prior knowledge and we see five minutes later, she builds from what the student said. So she was, you know, and so again, they're bringing the theories to bear. And then the final assignment, because ultimately they will be designing their own learning environments through writing lessons, is they write a lesson plan and they annotate it. So there's this common thread, right, where I'm asking them to do the same activity of annotation, but increasingly more difficult contexts, right, 
I know each of these contexts are slightly different. They all relate to teaching and learning, but they're slightly different so that that transfer is flexible. So now that's become a practice that I hope that they're able to use flexibly. They'll regularly say, huh, what's happening here and why? How can I connect this to a theory about development or cognition? Um, so now we're going to take, and this is sort of perfect timing because we have food. So let's take about 10 to 15 minutes to sort of start eating and do this reflection activity, okay? And we'll come back together. It's about 10 past. So I'm going to say, well, it's eight past. I'm going to need 12 minutes. <laughs> let's say we'll come together at 20 past. I'd like you to consider a course um, that you teach. Again, let's be specific. In which you're asking students to apply a similar concept across multiple concepts. I'm sorry, ab ab across multiple contexts. Okay, so again, it might have to do with measurements, right? We can imagine Glenn's example from before, right? Um, choose a concept that's central to the course or your field. Think about multiple moments over the course you can, you can return to that concept. So in the same way, I want students to, to regularly think about applying theory to practice, right? What's something that you regularly want students to be doing? And think about how you can create sort of purposefully multiple moments when you ask students to return to that and transfer, right? You've already thought about doing this connecting theory to practice in this context. Transfer that experience and that knowledge to this new context that's a little bit more difficult, right? Now I want you to transfer it to this next context. So maybe think about having three touchstones, right? Where you can promote this transfer from one to the next. But first, you need to think about what is that concept that's going to be strung across. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, we'll take about 10 minutes, get some food, start thinking. You'll just sketch out an idea, and then we'll do some sharing. This notion that you're sort of decreasing support along the way um, is important too, right? That you can make it harder and harder and harder for them to get to, like a more less familiar to them right? And your cueing will be less explicit along the way so that eventually when they leave the course, you're hoping that they do it all the time. So we have one more section to go. We're going to talk about metacognition. And we started talking at some of the, the issues that came up earlier. Um, I think we'll find that metacognition actually helped. There's sort of a solution to a lot of those issues and a lot of those challenges. But I first asked you to do a little bit of, uh, to reflect on a practice that you could sort of be really explicit that could help you promote transfer, right? Help your students become, um, sort of be um, oriented towards this notion of flexible transfer and that you take one concept or idea or principle that's important across different kinds of problems in your field and that you introduce it to students and ask students to deploy it multiple times in multiple contexts. And going even further, again, thinking about something like going from Taco Town to a modest proposal, that you begin with contexts that are maybe more familiar to students, where you give them a lot of support, and then over time you're sort of taking away some of that support and, um, and making those contexts perhaps less familiar and more in line with your field. Um, so did anyone come up with any ideas for that? And we've lost a few folks to the break, so those of you who are here have to do more work. <laughs> Anyone want to share? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uncertainty. Oh, I love it. A lot in, I mean, that's just universal, across, especially in forensic science, because we have, you know, we have to know the level of confidence that we have. So we have to, yeah. two, it's a two part problem. The first, we have to assess it properly. Right. And then we have to communicate it. And that's a, it's a recurrent theme in every single class that we teach. That's really interesting. And so, can you describe a little bit the sort of different moments where you'd ask students to deploy or sort of, a, deal with this notion of uncertainty well yeah like a class on fingerprint development and you know how do you how do how is a fingerprint analyst confident in their assertions and what degree of error do they have and how do you assess it and if they say that it's a match what on earth do they mean right to what degree of probability and that, that, that same kind of cognitive process i guess applies to every domain of forensic science whether, and yeah i'm sorry whether it's dna or forensic chemistry or blood spatter or you know, looking at a fiber under a microscope. And so you can imagine that to make this even stronger, if you're saying this notion of uncertainty, this almost principle of uncertainty permeates the entire field, if that's the case, 
then this doesn't just have to be something that we regularly mark for our students. Do you see how we're dealing with uncertainty again here? Here are the range of different ways in which we're dealing with the fact that we have this uncertainty. Um, oh, look, we're doing it again. We use a different range of, you know, of um, principles or approaches to dealing with uncertainty in this context, but what's consistent what are, might our heuristic be or these sort of abstracted ideas related to, to um, uncertainty that we can string across or thread across a course. But then you also can imagine if it is something that feels endemic to a field or a major, can we not be having conversations with our colleagues about this? Um, so that we're not only threading something across a course, but we're threading it across a program. So let's really name this thing that might have only come up for you because you did a reflective activity about it. But once you set it in a department meeting, why, yes, that is sort of fundamental to what we do in our professional standards. It doesn't call it out like that, but yes, we could see it evidenced in all these places. Let's, as a program, think about scaffolding this idea, not just across one course, but across courses, right? How are we gonna introduce these ideas in 100 level class and then make sure that they get them really, they're really able to deploy them in novel context in a 400 level capstone. Um, this also gets back to this notion of habits of disciplinary habits of mind, right? So that might be one of those disciplinary habits of mind in forensics that we, we talked about this in the last session. Um, how do we deal with uncertainty? That is something that forensic specialists regularly are thinking about. And so rather than giving them Forensics 101, here's all the stuff you need to know how to do, in addition to that, when we teach a 100 level class, even if it's an intro class that no majors take, we want them to be able to know that this is essential to the discipline and to know how to sort of um, be thinking like a forensic specialist, right? Even if that's not something they go on to do. That's, I love that, that's helpful. Excuse me. So no, please case, enjoy. Um, I teach a couple of crop science classes, and this really applies to both. But one of them is the, the, more specifically is a forage and grassland management class, where we talk about perennial uh, grasses and legumes. But I use budgeting um, mm. or or balancing supply and demand is kind of this this central theme right and, and so I, I bring it up when we talk about okay we've got a bunch of pasture here and we've got a potential number of animals we can put on this pasture how do we figure out the, the supply and demand balance right okay and so we go through a bunch of exercises and, and actually we do some of this one okay um, because some of it has to do with economics. It's, it's not all just- Principles that regularly apply. And some has to do with water quality and sustainability. But so then I bring it up again, budgeting, when we talk about nutrient management, mm. okay? Plants are taking off X, Y, Z yes. levels of nutrients. You can replace those in relation to what came off. You know, there, there's a basis for knowing how much fertilizer you put. Right. And then if we ever talk about irrigation, it's the same. Plants are using water. Right. If we're going to put water back on, we need we need to know how to figure out that, that supply and demand yes. balance. So I love it. Budgeting mm -hmm. in all of these different contexts. Yeah. We're always budget. Had you made that had you realized that that was a frame that applied to these different contexts? before this reflective activity or did, yes. Yeah, actually, yeah. And you made that explicit for your students. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you helped me clarify. Okay. <laughs> but I, I guess where I'm going with that as well is that sometimes these things are too obvious to us, right? Or not obvious enough that we don't make them explicit. And certainly our students don't have those same frameworks that we have. Right, so we need to make these things explicit. Um, we need to remind them, right? We, um, I do some facilitation work with the Advanced Center here and Melissa Latimer in the Advanced Center always does this thing where she says, facilitator time out. I'm gonna stop facilitating this and talk to you about how I'm facilitating it, right? And I, I always say, oh yeah, I do that with teaching. I would say, okay, I'm gonna stop teaching and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how I'm teaching this, right? So I'm gonna stop talking about budgeting for a minute and I'm gonna let you know 
this notion of budgeting is going to keep coming up throughout the semester in really different contexts. It's a framework that I use for thinking about soil science regularly, and I want you to be doing the same. Okay, now back to the reg regularly scheduled program, right? So we can add in these sort of metacognitive activities. Thank you for sharing that. So now we're going to talk about developing metacognitions. We started out by reconsidering prior knowledge. What are the range of ways in which we could think about what useful kinds of knowledge our students can bring to bear to learn what we want them to learn in our disciplines? Then we thought about transfer. How can we make sure that that knowledge transfers from one context to the next, knowing that so often it doesn't. It lies dormant, even though it has all of this possibility, right? That's so frustrating. Here's the great thing about metacognition. It helps us develop, it helps us promote transfer. So what is metacognition? I'm taking these nice definitions from um, some work by Bereiter and Scardamalia. Um, this is one of my favorite articles of all time. Um, and this is about reflection and writing. And one of the reasons I'm using this as an example is because I think all of us in this room will from, um, feel that this is very familiar because m almost all of us deal with writing of some sort, okay? So first, they talk about what metacognition is or we could interchangeably use metacognition and reflection. So reflection is here viewed, following Piaget, as a dialectical process by which higher order knowledge is created through the effort to reconcile lower order elements of knowledge. Okay, let me say that in a different way. We have details, right, that we deal with all the time that eventually we extrapolate to understand larger concepts, right? So I might watch Saturday Night Live and read McSweeney's and watch funny satirical films regularly. And each time at the beginning, I'm sorting it out, right? We can't, probably can't remember the first time we watched something satirical, but it took us some time to work through it. What is this thing? How is it working exactly? How am I supposed to make sense of it? And then we did it again. We did it again. This is all the data, the discrete kinds of data. And eventually over time from that data, we created something larger, a concept or a principle related to satire. Oh, this is that thing. This is satire, right? Now here's what often happens, especially for those of us who are content experts, we just start residing in the world of the principle, the world of the, con of the concept, and we get away from the concrete. We're almost always doing a top-down process, right? Where we're saying, oh yes, I see this thing happening in front of me, I know, I know how to label it, I don't need to figure it out, I know how to label it, that's a X issue, right? Our students are working often from a bottom up kind of process. I'm dealing with this problem for the first time. I don't yet have a concept I can relate it to, right? For those of you who are familiar with sort of episodic and semantic ways of thinking, this is another way of talking about that, right? Thinking about or Tony and others who write, who, who write about semantic knowledge, which is that sort of conceptual knowledge versus the episodic knowledge, the data that we're building every day and figuring things out all the time. It takes a lot of time and work to deal at this, in this bottom up way. It's much faster for us to do the top down. Here's where metacognition comes. Does that make sense? I know that was a bit of a, a detour. But that sort of makes sense, the notion between like a bottom-up process, co cognitive process, and a top-down. Here's where metacognition comes in, especially those of who are, us who are content ex experts or do the same things again and again and again. We don't usually have much of a conversation or think a lot about the process back and forth. I see a little bit of data, right? I see a nose and two eyes. I know it's a face. I'm not going to really think a whole lot about it. I just know it's a face, right? Every once in a while, maybe now I'm in a museum and I see a Picasso. Oh, okay, I have to reconsider that. I have to delve a little bit deeper, but most of the time I don't reconsider that. Eyes, nose, face, okay? Metacognition and reflection is as they're saying that dialectical process between the bottom up and the top down or the higher order and the lower order, right? What's my data? What's the principle I think I'm connecting it to? And let me, let me delve a little bit deeper and make sure I understand and interrogate that connection that I might assume, right? Or I might not know to make. 
expert writers engage in an elaboration and reformulating goals and plans for achieving goals. I'll explain what this looks like in a minute. Critically examining past decisions, anticipating difficulties, reconciling competing ideas. Okay. In the context of writing, experts do this regularly. This dialectical process of what is it in this case that I've done, that I've composed? What is this sentence that I've written? And what is the larger thing I'm trying to do here? Am I trying to summarize something for my reader? Am I trying to problematize something for my reader? Am I trying to create some curiosity in my reader? And experts know to do this regularly. It's part of the expert practice. And in fact, we know most experts engage in metacognitive work a lot. Here's another way of thinking about this with writing, and this is what will probably feel really familiar to you. Scardamalia and Berider conceptualize writing between these two spaces. The first is the content space, and I'd say this is what our students are really, really good at. What do I mean? What am I thinking that I want to say? They're pretty good at that, right? They have an idea, and they put it down on paper. Here's the problem. They don't always consider the rhetorical space, which is, now that I've put this thing down on paper, does it actually reflect my idea well? Okay, so they might write something and you read it and you ask them some questions and they'll say, I told you that, I wrote it in the paper. Nope, no you didn't, right? Because they haven't considered that rhetorical space. Are my ideas present for my reader? Okay, they don't fill out the loop. Experts fill out the loop and they do it through metacognition, right? They're regularly asking themselves and thinking about from the perspective of the, of the reader, what am I saying? How am I saying it? Is my reader going to understand it in the way that I'm suggesting it, right? And why might this not be the best way to do it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so a quick sort of review of metacognition. Because metacognition often takes the form of an internal dialogue, many students may be unaware of its importance unless the processes are explicitly emphasized by teachers. An emphasis on metacognition needs to accompany instruction in each of the disciplines because the type of monitoring um, required will vary, okay? So, all of us in all of our disciplines are regularly checking back in on our thinking, right? We're thinking about our thinking, metacognition, we're reflecting. And sometimes we do that in disciplinarily unspecific ways. Did I write what I mean? Did I convey what I mean to someone other than myself, right? But sometimes these metacognitive kinds of questions are specific to our disciplines. So, um, in history, a student might be asking himself, who wrote this document? And how does that affect the interpretation of events, right? This is something historians do, right? They source and they think about based on the source, what is that going to tell me about this historical perspective? But we might not do that necessarily with a lab report, right? That's really different. In history, we have a certain epistemology, right, that different people construct meaning in different ways. So every document might have a different interpretation. In chemistry, we might not assume that. We're assuming that things are replicable, right, and that every, everyone who does the same experiment should ultimately come up with the same thing. Perspectives should not matter, right? So we'd have a different set of metacognitive questions. They give an example in physics as well. The physics student might be monitoring her understanding of the underlying physical principle at work, like, right? I'm watching some sort of set of motions and I'm trying to understand what are the principles that can help explain these motions. Can anyone think of some examples in your field? What are some typical kinds of metacognitive questions that are part of your disciplinary practice? Well, one of the examples that I use a lot, I teach first semester physics students that, mm. are, that are kind of coming in, I think last time we used this idea of being good at school. Yes. Uh, and they're good at school for the most part, but they're not good at, at thinking like physics people think in, in sort of the more sophisticated professional physicist way, right, of does this make sense? They're more 
I'm going to find an equation and I'm going to plug a bunch of numbers in and do a little algebra and then the answer will, you know, be there. Uh, and so we try to think, you know, we try to build in this idea that, you know, does this answer make sense? And we've had, you know, I always give this example. We've had exams where the question talks about how high is the satellite above the earth if it takes two hours to orbit or whatever. And the students that are thinking in the school way will make a mistake somewhere and they'll write this satellite is one times 10 to the minus sixth meters above the earth or whatever. <laughs> and then they'll draw a big box around it and hand it in, right? Which is clearly not right. Um, and so we say, look, the student who recognizes that and says to the grader, this is obviously wrong and makes no sense, but I'm out of time. Right. That paper gets more partial credit let's mm -hmm. say, than the one that just draws the box. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, and that's, and we could probably extrapolate from that further, right? When we think about physics, are we thinking about it when you're, when you work in the discipline, you see physics all around you in the world. And so that connection to does it make sense is, can I see it and understand it? For someone who's a novice, just starting out learning about physics, if they're only understanding it as a set of equations, they haven't connected those equations to the world around them at all. So that question even of does it make sense, they don't know to ask, right? So in part, it's part of that disciplinary practice of seeing it in the world around us. Physics is at play all the time, right? And this is when I talk to scientists and work with scientists, this is regularly how scientists, scientists see the world in science. They see explanations for, or they ask about, this is why scientists make observations of the world all the time, right? It's part of their disciplinary practice. But the kid in Physics 101 just has learned to apply, apply procedures, apply formulas. That's really interesting, yeah. I quite regularly teach a workshop to practitioners, forensic practitioners, on how to interpret spectra, the command of these instruments. Mm. And it's amazing when, when you ask them, you show them spectra. I mean, they do it for a living. And then we go through the practice of trying to remind them of how, how they do what they do. Right. You know what I mean? And then when I give us some examples, I say, okay, now, you know, I've gone through the process a dozen times. Here, here's how we go through the process. Mm -hmm. And I show them a spectrum. What, what's the first thing we should think? Their hands goes up and they, they jump straight to the fourth thing because it's what they always do and they know you know they recognize the drug oh it's cocaine okay. like, no 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 let's you forgot the rules right you know, what's the first thing we do the right. first thing you do is look for this type of a, a pattern or that you know what i mean they 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 kind of forget forget that their thinking is stepwise and yes. they, they they speed through it and they end up with a conclusion and which they, they forget all the little processes can allow them to sometimes the processes are there for a reason yeah. to catch incorrect thinking but as a field expert you know we regularly make these mistakes yeah. right they, they can't make it explicit no. so we know we've talked about this again for those of you who are here last time we talked about expertise and that what's the great thing about studying experts is that we can borrow expert practices teach them to novices and makes their learning go faster, right? They don't become experts by having these practices, but they can help them on their road towards being expert. Figuring out what are the kinds of metacognitive questions we ask ourselves all the time, and the different kinds of metacognitive activities we engage in, and making those explicit to our students helps their learning and helps them on their path towards potentially becoming expert in the field. But if it's a 100 level class, that's not our goal, it still helps them learn. Right. Um, so in part, it's us figuring out what is it that we do when we are expert. And, you know, again, that idea with writing, that's probably really familiar to you all. You regularly read what you've written after you've written it. And sometimes you might even write, which is silly, but we know our students don't always do it. Why do we do that? Does it make sense? Right. Does it flow? Does this paragraph lead to this paragraph? Do I get across the major ideas that I wanted to get across? Um, am I too repetitive? All of those kinds of things we know to ask these metacognitive questions about writing. I'd also say that there are a lot of structures in place for us to be metacognitive. There's so many places for review in our world, right? Be it through scholarly review, right? Peer review or annual review when people are regularly saying like, did you do the things you said you were going to do? And by writing our annual review narratives, we're asked to be metacognitive regularly. Are we giving our students regular opportunities to 
to be metacognitive. So it's not just that it's an expert skill or it's a skill of experts, but we are also within our, our experience, our daily professional experience, we are asked to be metacognitive regularly. Are we asking our students to do these same things? Um, so I'll give one example. Every single time I give my students an assignment, I ask them to reflect on that assignment when they turn, not like a weekly reflection, right? But every time they have a major assignment. And I do this for a range of reasons. There's a sort of psychosocial thing going on as well, right? I'll always say to them, when you turn in an assignment, I know this is not reflective of who you are as a person or what you're capable of doing in the world, right? This is what you were able to do for me this week, given all the other stuff going on in your life. So don't think, you know, and that takes some of that pressure off, right? Um, but then I also want them to be thinking about their learning. It's going to make the assignment more meaningful for them. And I also think it's going to help them towards the next assignment. So I ask, what was hard about this? We do that all the time, right? Gosh, this class is not going as well as I'd want it to. Why? What's hard about it this year, right? Or I cannot get the conclusion of this paper to work. What's hard about it? What's getting in my way? That's really important for us to be able to get over that challenge. We need to identify it first. Our students might just walk away, throw up their hands. This is just frustrating. I hate it. I hate this class. I hate this assignment. I sort of sound like my 10 year olds, but I also sort of sound like our students, right? So let's try to get, get them to think, what was hard about this assignment? What did I learn from this assignment? That seems silly in a way, right? But it's not. Our students don't always think about, what did I learn from this? And we are so careful in designing these things. Let's make those things explicit, right? What might my GTA and my professor do differently to make this assignment better for me next time? What kind of question is this? How can I figure out and deploy the resources that I need to make my learning better? What can I do better for the next assignment to better support my own learning, right? So how can I deploy resources? What is it that I can do myself? And then finally I say like, just like catch all, anything else you want us to know? Sometimes we get important things here too. So this is not disciplinarily specific. These are really general questions about learning that this is really easy to do every time. Sometimes I write this into eCampus. They put in the assignment and then they do this. Sometimes they do it in class the next day when they come in um, or whenever it was due. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip this just really quickly. I also ask them to annotate the course at the end of the semester. I want them again to be thoughtful about their learning and how they learned over the course of the semester. So all of the learning theories that we do, I ask them to look at the course and the syllabus and they annotate it for me. And I'll say, one, it's more useful for me than SEIs. It actually gives me substantive feedback on the class and what worked. I'd also say, I think my SEIs are better after they've done this because they realize that there's a method to the madness, right? They'll say, oh yeah, it did make sense. We did this reading before we did this assignment. Even if I told them that in the moment, having them reflect back on a semester's worth of learning actually gets them to think about a little bit something about their own learning. Okay, we don't have a lot of time left. I do have one activity. We've got almost 10 minutes and I really wanna make sure we get a chance to do it. So I'm gonna ask you to get into sort of small groups and we'll take about five minutes, okay? We'll have one group. Let's do you two back there, okay? Minute by minute in class, what are ways that we can promote metacognition? And here's another example. When we did Taco Town, I did not ask you, is this satire? Once you told me it was satire, I was asking questions about your thinking. How did you know, right? I ask my students, sometimes I'll say, at what moment did you know that? So those are sort of in the moment ways that we can promote metacognition. So think in your class, moment by moment, what are some ways in which we could promote metacognition? This group, this pair right here, each class beginning, what is some sort of way that we can promote metacognition at the beginning of each class? Okay, you two, uh, let's do you three, uh, nope, two, you two <laughs> will do each class ends. How can you promote metacognition? During the week, like in between classes for homework and reading. Okay, um, we'll do you two, we're gonna do at the midterm and you two will do semester's ends. Okay, what are some ways at the semester's end that you can promote metacognition for your students? These things can sometimes be disciplinarily specific, that's fine, and sometimes they'll be general. We'll take five minutes and then we'll share out. 
All right, we have about three and a half minutes left, and I want to make sure every group has a chance to share. So, who wants to go first? Share out one great idea that your group came up with. I'll start. I'll start pointing if you don't. Because don't all right, thank you. And what were you guys? We were homework and reading, so it was kind of like we. I think you said it when you gave it to us, like on a weekly basis. So I was thinking more what because what I do is I was try to connect it with what we've covered before in terms of the grand themes, concepts, and ideas that are part of the course, not just all the details that they focus on. Right. And likewise, I try to put it in the context of what will be upcoming, which of course they have no clue about, but just say, and oh, in the future, this will be happening. And then what Tony, who teaches epidemiology, was saying that also she's connecting with readings and things that are from the outside. Mm. And so you're kind of connecting them to other contexts and frameworks that are even outside the course. I don't know. If that's and so are you doing that by asking explicit questions? Like do you ask, have to ask her. <laughs> so do you That's ask them to, rep to respond to specific questions sort of on a discussion board in between class? Yeah, that's yeah. usually what we do. Um, I have them because a lot of times I'm, I'm, I'm teaching, I mean, I'm very methods heavy. You know, how do you study, yes. you know, these disorders and populations? So a lot of times I'll bring in outside studies of like what, you know, like from peer reviewed articles and things like that. Well, look how they did it. How could you do this differently? Mm. What if you change the design? And so I try to get them to think a little bit outside the box with that. So that's how I'm kind of like building so that they can see that, I mean, there's, like I always tell the science, that good science is defensible. So <laughs> it has to, it has to like make sense. There's no right or wrong. And so, there, and I'm also hearing you say there might be different kinds of methodological questions or different kinds of metacognitive questions you ask. Sometimes they might be methodological, right? What's a methodological technique you've learned from reading this that you could apply? Sometimes it might be content based. What's something you learned here that resonates with something we've learned previously? Fantastic. All right, we won't get to everyone, but let's do one or two more. Some great metacognitive ideas, uh, activities you came up with or prompts. I don't know if it's great. I'm sure it is. I'm not sure it's metacognitive. <laughs> um, I teach a course on readability. Yes. And I've done a lot of that in, with live groups, but I'm doing it online now. When I do it with live groups, I put up on the screen a wall of dense text. Yes. And say, you want to read that? And you watch the physical postures and movements of the people. And then uh, I add a little white space and I throw the, the same text up and I said, how about now? Well, that's a little better. And then another one that's a little bit more white space. And then a final one that is the way it's supposed to be. And you see this physical. <sighs> but they might not be aware of the change in their even physical comfort the level, thing. their visceral experience, unless you ask them to become aware of it. Tell me about how that felt. Tell me about how you're feeling right now. And sometimes it has to be an in the moment kind of think aloud. How are you guys feeling right now looking at that text? And then you may even ask that next Benicotta question, why do you think you're feeling that way? What about the text is making you feel that way? Maybe you ask them afterwards, right? Yeah. How did you feel progressively overseeing those three texts? Gosh, I was really stressed out and now I'm more relaxed. Why is that, right? And those why and how kinds of questions become really meaningful. I know we're getting to the end, but I wanna say one last really important thing about these metacognitive questions, especially in this group was an in the moment, in class, minute to minute. What's essential about these kinds of questions is the answers to them help every student in the room. If I ask you for the right answer, right? And you give me the right answer, but Tony did not have the right answer. Knowing the right answer really probably does not help her very much, unless she's just, and the goal is to memorize the answer. But if I say, how did you get that answer? Or why do you think that's the right answer? Your answer to that question really helps Tony, right? And so by asking these metacognitive questions, you're doing a couple of things. One, you're opening up your path to meaning making for the whole group. You're also making it really productive to be wrong, right? So let's say you didn't get the right answer. Han, tell me a little bit about how you got that answer. 
oh, that is so helpful. I've seen a lot of us make these mistakes. Let's write out this pathway to getting the answer. And I can see why a lot of us would take this pathway. Tell me why you chose to go in that direction rather than in that direction. And do we see? And then I can thank you at the end. Thank you so much for sharing. That was really, really helpful, right? Even though it makes it so that the process matters more than the answer, which we'd probably all say, yes, that is very much the case. It's the same thing with that box versus doesn't make sense. Okay, it doesn't make sense, but I recognize that at least, right? Okay. So just a really quick sum because we're out of time. We started out by thinking, by reconsidering prior knowledge. And again, I'd really, con you know, continue doing what you're doing. What's the the sort of most basic, not to make a, a um, PH pun there, but the most basic fundamental stuff I expect my students to know, right? But also, what may be foundational knowledge that I don't even know my students have that I don't even know I can build from, right? So what are the range of ways in which our students may have relevant prior knowledge and how can we figure that out? How can we then ensure that we are transferring that relevant prior knowledge to our classroom? but then also promoting the transfer of what we've learned in our classrooms, outside our classrooms, to the next course in the sequence, to their future career, to understand the world around them. And then one way in which we know we can promote transfer is through metacognition, okay? What is it that I know, right? And how do I know it? And how can that get me towards this new space, this novel problem, to help me to solve this novel problem. And through metacognition, we know transfer is more likely to happen. But in the same way that transfer doesn't happen on its own, metacognition doesn't often happen on its own. And that's where it's really important for us to sort of add these, these scaffolds and these supports along the way. And they could be so small, just making sure every time you ask a question, you ask a follow-up. Why do you think that? Tell me how you got that answer, right? That doesn't take a lot of time, but it really shifts the nature of the conversation. And I'd say also, we talked a little bit about sort of emotions, right? It shifts the nature of what it means to engage in the class and people start feeling comfortable. Oh, I sort of got complimented for getting the wrong answer, right? Okay, maybe I'll be more likely to, to provide an answer next time. We are four minutes over. I apologize for that. Thank you for a really, for all of your attention and all of your engagement. Um, it's really, it's a joy. So thank you for being here. Thank you.